And so for the remaining time, we'll be presenting on chapter 12, which is a summary of the organization of the nervous system. And this is basically a reminder, so many of the systems we've seen were made of tubes. The osteon and the tuberculae of the skeleton, there's a tubular structure which either packed together into compact bone or distributed out with spaces kind of at irregular angles with lots of space between the tubes uh, to form spongy bone. Muscles were tubes within tubes within tubes within tubes. And we're going to find that there's a definite organization to the nervous system and the, um, the basic uh, organization. So we're going to start by recognizing these eight categories of the nervous system. The eight categories shown here are in pairs, two, four, six, eight, and they're nested within each other. So at the highest level, we recognize a central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord period. The brain and spinal cord period. The rest we call the peripheral nervous system. And that we have to break down into different sections. So anatomically, we do recognize that the peripheral nervous system comes off of the brain stem, which we call cranial nerves, and the spinal cord outside the skull, which we call spinal nerves. Anatomically, these two anatomical categories, cranial nerves and spinal nerves, make up the peripheral nervous system. But the way we divide this peripheral nervous system is by function. And here we have to think about which way the nervous impulse is traveling. Is the nervous system or the nerve element sending a message toward the central nervous system? So to be real simple about this, my, the tip of my finger can detect heat and cold. It can detect pain and pressure, touch. And when those things occur, receptors generate signals and send them in toward the central nervous system. We call that the afferent or in inward, the sensory nervous system before sending those message toward our brain and spinal cord. When it gets there, there's a thing called information processing where neurons fire and compare to memory and compare to other measures from elsewhere in the body, and they generate a response. That response goes out. That's the efferent system or the motor nervous system, and it's going to be moving away from the brain and spinal cord. So if, in fact, the sensory system, I put my finger on a hot skillet, sends a pain message all the way up to the spinal cord, where a reflex sends a message right out to one of the muscles of this arm to jerk it away. That's the motor response. So there will be a signal back out to what we call an effector. We only have three kinds of effectors, muscle, gland, or fat. The outgoing messages can only uh, affect those three types of tissues. Now, the sensory system is kind of unitary and easy to understand, but the efferent or motor system has to be broken down because some of this we're aware of and under conscious control. This is our skeletary skeleton skeletal muscles, and voluntary nervous system. We call this the somatic system. Like I say, it's all under voluntary control. Now, that doesn't mean we have to concentrate on it all the time. Go, uh, as I grew up, I learned to balance. I learned to stand up on two legs. And that's sort of like an automatic subroutine. I can decide when to stand up. I don't have to really focus and control that. I have a habit, a somatic program that's running, mostly in the cerebellum, that allows me to do that in the background, balance on two feet, while I can think about other things, like my lecture, like walking back and forth. Now, in addition to that somatic system, the skeletal muscles, we have an autonomic system. This is all of our subconscious regulation and there's a lot of our metabolism that is regulated subconsciously 
So although we can predict the beat of our heart, I can tell you if I go outside that door and run up and down the stairs five times, I know my heart's going to speed up. But I'm not in conscious control of that. It responds to internal signals from the body, largely related to oxygen supply. In addition, smooth muscles in the walls of other organs are effectors on the autonomic side, plus glands. Glands have to be told when to fill up and when to secrete. And finally, fat. When are we depositing uh, nutrients as fat, storage, and when are we mobilizing that to use as energy to produce ATP? Now, this autonomic side, though, does have organization of elements from different uh, organ systems throughout the body. So let me give you an example. When I am threatened, I have what's called a fight or flight response. I don't want to just stimulate one system. I'm going to need my skeletal muscles. So the cardiovascular system is going to change to flood the muscles with blood flow, high blood pressure and high blood volume. The heartbeat is going to speed up and the heart stroke is going to increase in volume. The lungs and breathing rate are going to speed up and the depth of breathing are going to, uh, is going to increase. So my point here is a fight or flight reaction needs multiple ner uh, uh, systems turned on. And because we're talking about blood flow, we only have so much blood. We want it all going to muscles. We're going to cut down the blood flow to those so-called non-essential systems. If I have truly a threat that is a fight or flight uh, uh, situation, whether or not I survive is not going to depend on my digestion or my urination or my reproductive tract. So we're going to cut down blood flow to those tracts at the same time we increase flow to the heart, lungs, and muscle. So this is a whole body response, and that's called sympathetic stimulation. It organizes the autonomic signals to multiple organ systems to produce a syndrome of response for the whole organism. But these are emergency situations. We don't know exactly when they may be turned on. Whereas parasympathetic is called rest and digest. It relaxes the body. And the name tells you one of its major functions, our regular feeding of the body. So if we eat three meals a day, that's three times when we're dumping a whole bunch of, of calories into our body at once. And what we want is we want that food to be physically and chemically broken down and absorbed and then distributed throughout the body. That, and that involves kind of an inverse of sympathetic stimulation, which is why it's called parasympathetic. We're going to flood that blood flow into the walls of the digestive tract. We're going to keep the heart calm. We're going to keep the breathing rate calm. But we're basically going to cut off blood flow to the muscles. And in the absence of any real threat or stimulation, the, you know, the body feels relaxed. It feels, you know, after a big meal, sometimes you get drowsy. And uh, that's a behavior or a, a central nervous system response to parasympathetic nervous system. Just relax and let the body digest its food. Now, we're revisiting this functional cell that we call the neuron. And this is a multipolar neuron Look at that cell body, pretty typical with a nucleus, an endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, and ribosomes, mitochondria, cytoplasm, can all be seen here. So in, in terms of its equipment, it's a pretty standard cell. But the differences are shown around the perimeter with these branching root-like structures that stick out from the cell body. These are called dendrites, and these are dendritic branches. This is what makes the cell sensitive. These connect to other cells or other tissues to receive signals that will be directed toward the cell body. So this is kind of drawn in profile. What we're not seeing is that off the surface here that's facing you, more dendrites would be projecting up above the screen, kind of toward you. And behind, 
behind the screen, there's going to be more dendrites projecting. So this is basically a ball of roots that's projecting 360 degrees around the cell body and filling that space. Every place there's an end and every place there's a bare membrane, connection can be made. But there's definitely a direction to this cell. We're going to detect the stimulation up at this dendritic end at the cell body. And if we get enough stimulation, we're going to produce a firing, a nerve impulse that's going to travel down through this axon all the way to the branches at the other end. So it's going to deliver the stimulation down here to these, this end, which these are called telodendria. And you'll notice that these telodendria uh, approach the cell body of the next cell, but do not touch it. There's a gap there called the synapse. Does this sound familiar? Remember the neuromuscular junction was based off these telodendria type membranes forming gaps with the neuromus at the neuromuscular junction. The same thinking is going to apply when we do a nerve to nerve connection. These are the synapses of the blue cell. And so this is the presynaptic cell where the uh, stimulation is generated. Nerve impulse travels down in this direction and it's going to deliver potential stimulation to the synapses that are close to the postsynaptic cell. Now, this is where the muscle tissue um, and the neuromuscular junction analysis comes in handy. It's exactly the same kind of synaptic gap and neurotransmitter release that we're going to see that propagates nerve impulses. This is the synapse itself. See the gap? Also see the kind of fluid motion or this fluid structure of the cell. There's a kind of a depression here. And the telodendrion and this end plate approaches the postsynaptic membrane, but does not touch it. Loaded into these end plates in the synaptic terminal are vesicles shown in green that are full of neurotransmitter substance, just like before. But other than that, this is a continuous cytoplasm strand running all the way to the cell body. We will see endoplasmic reticulum. We will see membrane structures for the synthesis of materials in this part of the cell. We will see mitochondria for the generation of ATP and the support of the transmission of nerve impulses from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell. But I want to make this point. Most of our electricity depends on connections. A solid conductor that goes clear around the circuit. If you want the light bulb to light, you have to have a connection to the hot wire going up to the appliance, the socket, and the, and the uh, light bulb has to be there. It has to flow through the light bulb, which forces either a filament to glow or a gas to glow or an LED to glow. But then it has to continue through the ground wire all the way back to complete the circuit. That's how our electric, electric appliances work. This is very different. This transmits across this gap using, using neurotransmitter substance. Any gap in our electric circuits in our home, we call a short circuit. And uh, that breach will mean that the appliance is not working. So let's take a look at the different nature of electricity. First of all, this multipolar neuron that we uh, saw with the branching on the cell body, which fills space all around the cell body, providing connection to other cells. And an axon, which definitely lengthens the cell. Here's a very important exception. Some of these multipolar neurons connect sensors in the skin to the spinal cord through the efferent nervous system. Some of those axons are 30 inches long. 30 inches. So they're very extended in their in their uh, size compared to other cells. In other places, 
You know, the basic purpose of the axon is to pick up a stimulation here and transmit it a long way, maybe to the spinal cord, where it will stimulate another cell to send it to the brain. But there are other places where you don't have that big distance. You're going to pack these things together. Here's a cell that we find in brain and the dense part of sen sense organs, like the retina. In this case, you notice there's no real axon at all. There's just dendrites, and this would be three-dimensional. So the central cell would be covered by a big fuzzy ball sticking out in all directions, networking with other cells, other neurons in the brain. The bipolar neuron is a second type. You see the cell body in the middle of an axon with dendrite and synaptic terminals indicating the direction. In this case, uh, the nerve impulse would move top to bottom. And we find those in sensory organs like the eyes, the, the uh, nasal membranes that form the olfactory sense of smell, and uh, within the cochlea and the hearing organ. This unipolar neuron is much like the bipolar, but the cell body is offset. We find these in the sensory neurons, especially of the peripheral nervous system. So we do get some different morphologies depending on are we, are, do we have a single sensor out there and one line reporting back to the central nervous system? Or do we have neurons packed together, one on top of each other, forming not just hundreds, but thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of synapses with adjacent cells. That calls for a different anatomy to the cell type. We see that the neurons, in parallel with the classification of the overall nervous system, we have three class classifications. Sensory neurons are part of the afferent uh, peripheral nervous system. Motor neurons carrying the message back out to the effectors are the efferent neurons. Now, between those, we have what I call information processing. These are the association neurons receiving a message from outside the body. And that message, by the way, isn't just one message. It basically flows. So there's constant input telling you how much pain, how much damage, how much touch, how much heat. And what the brain, something that's aggregated neurons like the brain can do, it has interneuron connections to things like your memory. Is that amount of heat dangerous? Is it just unpleasant? Or is it comfortable? We would make those judgments based on our memory, based on our experience. These are the association neurons that are between sensing and motor response. Sensory receptors can vary as well. Interoceptors are distributed throughout the internal systems of the body, monitor the organ systems like digestion, uh, respiration, blood flow, urine production, reproductive activity. Those interoceptors are largely parts of the autonomic nervous system because although these things do change their activity in response to outside factors, um, and there is a, a response. So, for example, uh, a sight that causes sympathetic nervous stimulation. If you get a strong sympathetic autonomic response, you will immediately start breathing faster and you're, you will feel your heart accelerate from that, uh, you know, basically your eyes or your ears or your smell, hearing have reported a danger and immediately the body starts getting ready for action. Extraoceptors are generally distributed along the outside of the body and exposed to the environment because that's what they're monitoring. So on our skin, external senses like touch, temperature, and pressure are broadly distributed. Take a warm uh, uh, item and press it anywhere on your skin and you'll feel not just the touch, but the temperature. Distant senses are more complex. Here are the nerve endings are amplified by some special organ that receives information from the environment at a distance. We can see what's going on over there. We can hear what's going on over there. To some extent, we can smell uh, over a distance, although smell is by far those three 
is our least sensitive uh, sense. Now, touch is a chemoreception like smell, but it has a more immediate effect. Um, you're, you have to put that material in your mouth to actually activate the sense of taste. And the first use of the sense of the taste is to prevent you from swallowing something that's dangerous or chemically uh, would be classified as a toxin or a poison. Finally, there is a receptor that is distributed through our skeletal muscles and joints. Since the movement of the joints and the movement of the muscles pretty much summarize our body position. And that's critically important to things like balance and movement. Um, the proprioceptors receptors are sensing position. Position. Now, that position movement is reported on a constant basis from proprio receptors all over the body and combined on a constant basis with message from the inner ear, the so-called semicircular canals we'll talk about later, that are always monitoring the direction of gravity. So whether we're standing or lying down or face down or face up, it's transmitting a message about the direction of gravity. So together, where is gravity? That's up and down. And where is your body? Is what we use to constantly monitor and adjust our balance. So let's take a look at a second class of cells. We've mentioned the neurons and, and we've uh, named their major types, but you can't make a nervous system out of just neurons. Those are the signaling cells. So those are the sensitive cells that generate and transmit the nerve impulse. However, there are a number of cells that maintain, that construct the nervous system. And we're going to find something unique in the nervous system. The central nervous system is completely walled off from the conditions in the rest of the body. So we're going to talk about a blood side to the body and a, a cerebral spinal fluid side of the body. The fluid inside the central nervous system is cerebrospinal fluid. Although the blood delivers the glucose and oxygen to the brain and spinal cord, it is the neuroglia that regulate its entry into the central nervous system. So we're going to see lining cells and mounting cells. Ap ap ependymal cells line the cavities in the brain and the central and the spinal cord called the central canal. And they assist in making cerebrospinal fluid, keeping it circulating and basically walling off the surface. So there's cerebrospinal fluid on one side and cells on the other. Astrocytes and oligodendrocytes are cells that are branched like this. And they're specialized to actually grab a hold of neurons and hold them in position. This is more difficult than you might initially imagine because of the synapse. When you're making something where cells are in membrane contact, membrane to membrane, it's easier to provide those connections and to hook them to nearby connective tissue. But when you have to hold a cell so that the telodendrion forms a gap, a synapse, it's more difficult to maintain that proper gap given the chemical changes and the physical changes uh, of, based on body movement. Think about what's happening. You're, high, you're dehydrating and hyperhydrating all the time, adjusting your water balance. You're moving so that the actual weight of the tissue shifts and presses in a different direction based on gravity. So the astrocytes are there to maintain the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier is that covering of capillaries in the brain and spinal cord so that materials coming out of the blood have to go through the astrocytes through their membranes to get to the neuron side. So look at what they regulate in the central nervous system. They provide structural support holding the cells physically. And this is sort of like more like a spider webby kind of interlacing than a solid mat of tissue because that separation is important. Anytime two membranes touch, 
That's an electrical short circuit. It interferes with nerve transmission. Now, we're going to use astrocytes to regulate our ions, the electrolyte content, nutrients, dissolved gases like oxygen, and absorbed, absorb and recycle the neurotransmitters in the synapses. Astrocytes also form scar tissue after injury, so they close off injury. Oligodendrocytes are those cells that coat the axons of these neurons and they provide a structural framework. If you put an axon in each one of these, you'll notice how that for under this hot dog bun shaped structure, the axon is insulated, but it's also firmly held in position. Since the neurons are just bare membranes, when you wrap them, you, you can't just, uh, you know, basically pinch it in a small spot. The membrane won't stand up to that, so you coat it with the long tube-like -like structure shown here, and that allows you to hold it in position. Finally, among the neuroglia of the central nervous system, we, we have microglia. Now, this reminds me of the macrophages in the lungs, the alveolar macrophages, specialized white blood cells that clean up the lungs. Microglia are the equivalent, basically moving around detecting cell debris from cells that have died, been replaced by new cells, wastes that are generated, any pathogens that's in the central nervous system. And they basically are cells that eat until they die. So if they encounter a pathogen or a waste, they basically, by endocytosis, draw it in and protect the remaining tissue from exposure. So let's take a look. Here's a, uh, a figure on the left side that will be very familiar to us. This is a cross section, a transverse section of the spinal cord nervous tissue. You notice the nerve, the vertebra that forms around it has been, re re has been uh, removed. And we definitely see within it specific folds and specific colors. So this outer material that's lighter color is called white matter and the inner material is called gray matter. Now the difference, myelination or the covering of the axons by oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells causes white matter. Naked membranes that are connected only by synapse and held together by oligodendrocytes and, and astrocytes produces gray matter. You'll notice in the center of the spinal cord, there's a canal, and that's what's blown up over here. This is the central canal, a hole which provides a channel for cerebrospinal fluid to flow out of the ventricles of the brain and all the way down to the base of the spinal cord. These cells that are clearly close packed are the ependymal cells, separating the CSF from the surrounding tissue. Notice that as soon as you get beyond the ependymal cells, you get into connective tissues. You see these distributed nuclei with their uh, connective networks of fibers? That's what's occurring in the gray matter outside. And I'll show you a diagram that kind of emphasizes and amplifies that point. This is not building a wall of bricks. It reminds you more of the spongy bone model, but even more dispersed and interlaced because spongy bone is made of rigid rods with space between it. Uh, this surrounding material, the gray matter of the spinal cord, consists of the delicate dendritic branches and telodendria that are on the cell body of the neurons. Here's that diagram showing you the central canal and this layer of ependymal cells. Notice how the ependymal cells themselves branch and there are synapses among the ependymal cell extrusions and cells like the astrocyte shown here. Now in this drawing, blue is the membrane of the neuron, whether it's the cell body. Here is a telodendrion coming in, forming a synapse. And you'll notice right next to the synapse of the of the uh, neuron shown here, 
there are synapses with surrounding astrocytes. So these cells are part of the nerve transmission network. We have here an astrocyte. Notice how this astrocyte cell body is branching out in every direction, forming synapses on all of the neuron bodies and here at the head of the axon. They also form synapses with the ependymal cells. But look at the interesting thing the astrocyte does over here. The end of this protrusion, this dendritic branch, forms a tile-like flat plate which presses uh, against the edges of the adjacent plates. So what we see here is a complete wall of astrocyte material. Now, this is covering a capillary that is on the cerebrospinal fluid side of the um, central nervous system. This is being shown for the spinal cord, but you would get the same kind of thing if this were a ventricle in the brain. Notice how the connections, the actual contact between this transmitting neuron and other cells is regulated by the synapses it forms. There is no short circuiting by laying membrane over membrane. This is uh, on the right side, a repeat of the astrocyte, showing how the astrocyte can hold an axon in position. That's shown uh, on the left and over here on the right, how it can coat a capillary. And the whole point is that it doesn't prevent the oxygen from coming in, but it regulates the oxygen transfer. It doesn't prevent uh, glucose from entering into the uh, central nervous system, but it has to cross the astrocyte. Other nutrients do not cross because the astrocyte only allows glucose across. It's the only nutrient for that part of the body. Now over here, we see the oligodendrocyte and how this cell body sends out a, you know, snakes out a root. And when it contacts the axon, it wraps around and around. It's kind of interesting. If you can imagine an axon like this, the membrane comes and splits and surrounds it. And then one end of it begins growing around and around and around and around and around, producing multiple layers. Those layers insulate the axon electrically. You can see the layers here where you have cut away this sheath of membrane. This is called a myelin structure, a myelin sheath, and it's around the bare membrane of the axon. But when you take a soft material like a membrane, and try to hold it in place with a soft material like a membrane. Um, the more contact you have, the firmer is your uh, connection. And so this cell body and these uh, little struts here will be firmer, a little more strong, and will hold these two axons together, spacing them apart so that one signal flowing down this axon does not generate a response, a signal, a stimulation to this axon. Now, obviously, there are places that we'll talk about later where false signals are generated, things like referred pain. Um, when you see someone simulate a heart attack on on a, in a movie. You see them clutch their right left fist and hunch their left shoulder and kind of bend in that direction. That's because the pain impulse from the heart is going into the spine. And there's such a strong signal, it generates a magnetic field that actually stimulates the adjacent nerves. And those nerves are the afferent nerves from the left arm. And so that referred pain is not telling you that the left arm is suffering pain although that's what you perceive. Um, it is an interference. We know we can affect the nervous system from outside. We go to the doctor and sit on the table. He hits our hammer with, it hits our knee with a hammer and our foot kicks. It's a great example of uh, basically from the outside, sending a stimulation to that quadriceps muscle. It causes it to contract. 
So here's a general picture of what we call Schwann cells. These are not central nervous system, like oligodendrocytes. They are peripheral nervous system. But here's how they coat a new neuron. They grow over to it. See, it's surround. But it looks like in this picture, this side then begins to grow in loops internally, staying on the axon, a membrane. And after, what would that be? One, two complete revolutions, you have four or five layers of membrane holding that section. Now, the way Schwann cells myelinate the axon is with a sheath. It's like a bead, a kind of an elongated bead. But the next uh, node formed by the next one cell will leave a node of membrane exposed. So there is a gap of the membrane showing here, 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 the nodes between the Schwann cells. Odd effect is that it insulates most of this membrane, but it actually speeds up the nerve transmission. So the way we interpret this, since this structure, myelination, is what produces white matter. That means that nerve impulses go faster through white matter. So where you see white matter, you're basically sending a message to a far off place. And white matter allows it to go as fast as possible. There are a number of things that happen to our external sensors where you're going to want to send the message to the brain. So the reflex of a hot skillet is a good example. Finger goes down on a hot skillet. You basically want to jerk that back. You don't want to affect all these tissues or tell them unless they have a role in jerking that back. So you want the message to get here as fast as possible. It, this turns around in the spinal cord because it's a reflex reflex and often goes to my favorite muscle, the biceps brachii, because a quick flex of the elbow will take that cell destruction of those finger cells away. So over here on the neuroglia that are found in the peripheral nervous system, we mentioned Schwann cells, which is the way we myelinate peripheral axons. Now, interestingly enough, this can be a part of your active growth and healing because if you cut a nerve in the periphery, nerves can kind of grow out like roots in the arms and legs and restore sensation and even restore some motor control. This does not happen in the central nervous system. If you have a lesion of the spine, you become a quadriplegic or a paraplegic depending on the location of that brain. If you have a lesion in the brain, some brain cells have died, we call that a stroke, that does not heal either. That's a permanent loss. Now, the second kind of neuroglia in the periphery are satellite cells. These surround the cell bodies in the ganglia. We haven't mentioned much about ganglia. We find gray matter in the brain in the spinal cord, but outside the central nervous system, we find it in ganglia. And it is satellite cells that isolate that gray matter and do the same kind of regulation that astrocytes do in the central nervous system. So that's enough on neuroglia. They basically are the system constructors and system managers, and they're very important because of what the nervous system really does. Let me make a quick point. We know that our brain is responsible for learning and memory, but how do we form a memory? There's a kind of a quick dump in the frontal lobe for the things we're experiencing right now. And that produces what's called a short-term memory that is recalled right out of the frontal lobe, but it decays very quickly. If you move that memory to other regions of the brain, especially the cerebral cortex. The gray matter there responds with growth of new dendrites that provide new synaptic connections to adjacent cells. So long-term memory happens 
when you sleep on, when you cover the material again and again, and you sleep and overnight new synapses grow. The more synapses that grow, the more facilitation you're going to have of that nerve track, and that nerve track is a new memory. Stop renewing or reminding yourself of that information and other uh, synapses grow and replace it so that memory becomes less accessible or even is lost altogether. Schwann cells and peripheral axons can do some pretty remarkable things. We showed how they coat a single axon, but we kind of have this problem. Think about this arm. I have to have a, a, a network of nerves running up this arm to provide sensory input through the spinal cord to the brain. And then when motor responses are generated, I have to have multiple nerves running back to the different effectors, all the control of the different skeletal muscles, all of the glands like oil glands and sweat glands and mucus glands that may respond in different circumstances. Um, and particularly fat cells, although there are not very many out here, but fat cells can be affected. So those nerves and axons don't run singly, they run in bundles. Look what a Schwann cell can do. Here's a Schwann cell that has grabbed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine axons and is surrounding it. And it can not only surround each axon, you can notice it can separate those axons in the white matter along what we would call a plexus. Now this looks like a single strand of nerves, but it actually carries nine different nerves. We do not want the sensory nerve for heat to contact the sensory nerve for touch. Um, because that would produce a spurious signal. We want those signals coming from the receptors on the surface of the skin. So separating these axons allows those individual nerve impulses to remain separate. In the peripheral nervous system, I, and as I said, an amazing uh, uh, quality is that nerves can repair. Here's a break. So the proximal stump means this is the direction toward the central nervous system. This is the break. This is the distal stump. So you just cut this connection. But the thing I'd like to point out, when you do that, this cell can close. This debris down here is now waste. But the cells that are at the end of this axon, the nerves that are they are connected to are still being maintained in a living condition still being maintained. So if you can regenerate a connection right here, then you can restore both sensory input, which would be flowing in this direction, and motor commands, or motor commands if this is a motor nerve, which would be flowing in this direction. And that comes from cell division and cell growth. What happens right after you produce the break? What happens is these Schwann cells begin dividing from whatever living uh, material is left over on the right side. You see how they're dividing and closing this gap. Macrophages from our lymphatic system are busy removing cell debris, damaged material uh, in a wound. If this is a bigger wound, it would um, remove damaged muscle cells cut skin cells that have caused uh, cell death. Um, it would involve uh, remove bone splinters, a kind of a general um, a response. Basically, these macrophages you can see over here, eat until you die. They're not eating for nourishment. They get their nourishment from our blood system. But when they are activated to remove foreign material by phagocytosis, uh, they basically are good at clearing up the debris. So after you get the bridge, those cells be uh, forming the bridge, you actually get a root-like extension growing out of the axon, extending along this bridge, and eventually along the track leading to the next cell. 
Eventually, those Schwann cells do their wrapping trick, and this continuous cytoplasm in the axon is restored. So healing is possible. Now, I experienced this uh, um, uh, working on a farm when I was a senior in high school. I cut across the top of my um, thumb, and when it healed, I lost all sensory feeling, pain and heat, in a large area across the top of my thumb. So I was accustomed to being able to tap it. I could take a uh, something warm and feel no heat. I could take a safety pin and feel no pain. It was absolutely an insensate piece of skin. But about 10 years later, 11 years later, I don't know exactly when it healed, but about 10 years later, 11 years later, I noticed an itching and I went like, oh, wait a minute, that's that reason, I, the region I couldn't feel. And I noticed that pain, heat, and touch had been restored to that region by healing of the peripheral, peripheral nervous system. So we're actually ready to talk about the nerve impulse itself and how it's generated. And the one concept I want to finish with today is this concept of a transmembrane potential. Transmembrane is pretty easy, across the membrane. But potential is a formal term that refers to the potential that we call voltage. It's a potential energy. The potential difference would mean an unequal distribution of plus and minus charges across the membrane. So let's think about this as a membrane. And we have equal number of plus and minuses on both sides. If we hooked up a voltmeter across the membrane, it would read zero and there is no potential energy. Now, if we load up one side with a lot of plus charges while leaving the other side of the same, it would produce an attraction. So the negative ions over here would attract by the positive over here. And that's a, that attraction is a force. It's called the potential difference. And the needle on the voltmeter would move toward the positive side. And the more the difference between the right and left side of the membrane, the more it moves. So 10 millivolts indicates less of an electrical difference than 100 millivolts. This depends on ion movements and electrical signals. And here where you have to think back to carriers. Remember we talked about gates that were specific. Well, there are gates for ion, a protein that only allows sodium through it only moves in response to diffusion, so from high to low concentration, and it moves slowly. There are other sodium gates, one called the sodium-potassium pump, that moves sodium one way while it moves potassium the other way, and it burns ATP to do it. So with these different transport mechanisms in our membrane, the cell has the ability to separate ions and to set up specific relationships across the membrane. That produces a me measurable voltage called the transmembrane potential and all of our cells have it. All plasma cell membranes produce electrical signals by these regulated ion movements. We call this the cell potential and it's measured in millivolts. It's really important in neurons. Whereas there is a cell potential in every living cell, the neuron is a sensitive cell, just like the muscle cell. We saw before that the neuromuscular junction was stimulated by a nerve impulse, neurotransmitter was dumped in the synapse, and it produced an action potential on the membrane of the muscle where calcium rushed across and sodium rushed across different membranes to get that stimulated, translated into a signal that would cause muscle contraction. Here, what we're trying to do is fire a nerve impulse on the cell that's receiving that impulse. We're going to do that by setting up the ion concentrations in a specific way to produce a thing called a resting potential. We're then going to mess with that resting potential and the things that mess with it are the normal body activities like hydration or dehydration, osmotic pressure, 
things like bodily movements, things like dietary input, so a change in pH or uh, an addition of hydrogen ion, and forces like diffusion and electrostatic attraction plus attracts minus but plus repels plus means that there are forces on the cell membrane that allows the membrane to do work if you change the permeability. And that's going to be the secret. We're going to hold the ions in a certain relationship. When we stimulate to a certain point, the cell potential changes to a certain point, gates pop open. And when they pop open, ions rush across, changing the cell potential. And then other gates pop open and other ions rush back. And that becomes the nerve impulse. There's going to be five main processes in this neural uh, stimulation and impulse propagation along the cell. This foreshadows the sequence that we're going to see in what we call nerve firing. The resting potential is in every living cell. It's measurable with a voltmeter. The variations that are occurring in that cell based on movement or based on different chemistry or based on different hydration is called a graded potential. This is occurring on all of our cells and they are not nerve impulses. They are caused by the stimuli to the cell membrane. Movement, chemistry, water, any of those. But at some point, the change, the variation in that graded potential reaches a threshold value. This is called the action potential. And all of a sudden things change. It's an electrical impulse that becomes, it's produced by a graded potential that reaches a certain value. And it becomes self-propagating. So it literally, from that point, the first action potential races over the membrane of the entire cell from one end to the other, from cell body end to the telodendria. Now, once it gets to the end of the telodendria, you get synaptic activity, release of neurotransmitters, stimulation of the postsynaptic membrane, the chemical step in this nerve action. And finally, this application, you get a response from the postsynaptic cell. If it's enough stimulation to produce an active potential on the postsynaptic cell, then that cell fires and the nerve impulse races on. So to finish today with a picture, here's the neuron, the resting potential is constant in on every part of the membrane, all over the cell. It varies in ways we call graded potential. If the stimulation is enough, we reach an action potential. And there are ways that these graded potential kind of move over the cell body like waves. And so when they arrive here, at the beginning of the axon, an area called the axon hillock, they can add up and produce an action potential. The action potential then races down the axon all the way to every telodendrium. That's step three, action potential. Here's where the synaptic activity and neurotransmitter release occurs, and the reaction of this cell, the postsynaptic cell, is called the um, information processing. On the simplest level, does this action potential, this nerve impulse, stimulate this cell to fire or does it die out there? So that's an excellent uh, uh, coverage for today. And I'm going to stop recording uh, uh, chapter 12a and we'll return to this later.